special guest we have here to make that true for as long as we can, right? We're going to talk a little bit about leadership. We're going to talk a little bit about ethics. We're going to have fun. We're going to learn something. And we're going to take something that's going to help you all be the best person you can throughout your life. and just write about home. And so I made a couple records. Um, and one of the songs that I wrote was One Mississippi that was the official bicentennial song that I was asked to write. Uh, and then uh, it's turned into our new state song. So um, this uh, event is a celebration of that. I teamed up with incredible artist, uh, illustrator Sarah Frances Hardy. And uh, we have the children's book One Mississippi, but it's been a blessing and I'm truly grateful to have this opportunity to celebrate with the future generation. This is what it's all about. And some kids in a school petition. I am, I am so thrilled to be here. I am here at Casey School with Steve Azar. Uh, we have collaborated on a children's book based on our new official state song of Mississippi called One Mississippi. And I illustrated Steve's lyrics and we have turned it into a book. We're so excited to have Sarah Francis Hardy and Steve Azar to visit and share with our scholars about their book, One Mississippi. This is an engaging, inspiring, and motivating uh, activity and experience for our scholars, one in which they can learn about the planning process, and not only that, the planning process of, of writing and what goes into being an author and uh, illustrator. They can also uh, discover more about themselves and the world around them. Our legislature changing uh, what once was the official bicentennial song, making it our new state song. It's the most important song I've ever written in my life, and I'm most grateful for that. Great work. You guys are going on the road with me. Let's go. You're leaving school. Ability to speak two languages fluently can increase your qualifications for the career opportunities of tomorrow. That's why JPS recognizes scholars who demonstrate a proficiency in English and one other language by offering the seal of biliteracy exam. Earning the seal of biliteracy can be a gateway to great jobs and achieving the seal can support college admissions or language program placement. Juniors and seniors who have achieved a four or five on the English two test or an 18 or higher on the English segment of the ACT are eligible to take the seal of biliteracy exam. JPS scholars are strongly encouraged to pursue the seal of biliteracy exam offered in many languages. For more information, visit sealofbiliteracy.org or contact the JPS Office of Advanced Academics. award presentation at Clausell Elementary School where second grade teacher Rosalind Cotton was honored with the Alice Clark Award for her dedication and service teaching JPS scholars. You are the January Alice Clark Teacher of Excellence. I appreciate the commitment that you have for our scholars. Ms. Cotton, you are one of the very few who have in five years that you've worked with us, you have been had perfect attendance. I'm just really happy to do my job because I've done it so long. Mm -hmm. And this is almost my 20th year. Oh, wow. So that's so why I stay with it because I enjoy it. Thank you, Ms. Hey, ready to school! Hey, and a second celebration at Clausell was held to celebrate the school's A rating with a back to school halftime show. Whatever they want to do to remember that that starts here at Clausell Elementary, that starts here with the choices that they're making every single day. This event is a partnership with True Care. They are here to do a halftime show for our scholars to provide them with backpacks and supplies. We want to make sure our communities create an environment where our kids especially can learn and play and have fun. 
that I've come so far. This is amazing. JPS celebrates five outstanding Wells APAC Elementary School scholars who excelled in every subject earning prestigious recognition as inductees into the National Elementary Honor Society. I'm excited to be a part of something big, something that makes a change. Those students who have been selected by the faculty and our school for successfully completing the first semester with an 85 or above average in each subject. The Mississippi miracle is real, and y'all are a big reason why. Congratulations to Elizabeth Cantor, Bo Frost, Madeline Hall, Rhea Hunter, and Jane Walker. Your achievements stand as a testament to your determination in your studies. Lanier High School, under the leadership of Mississippi Sports Hall of Famer Orsmond Jordan, clinched a flawless 43-0 undefeated basketball season in 1964 and 65, averaging 102 points per game. The Bulldogs' dominance secured a national championship, winning a postseason tournament in Montgomery, Alabama. For more information about Jackson Public Schools and Black History Month, visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Instagram at JPS Student Voices, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast Channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com slash JPSITV. A big turnout for the JPS Special Programs Fair at Kirksey Middle School, where unique learning opportunities were on full display. So we're excited. Our parents are filing in. They're coming in. The energy's here. We got all of our special program schools here from Obama to Casey to McWilly. Our middle school programs with Wales Northwest uh, to Bailey and our high school programs although we had Forest Hill, Murrah, Jim Hill, and our college programs, Jackson Middle College and JTEX over at Tougaloo. The special programs fair allowed scholars and families to meet with educators and ask questions. Parents get an opportunity to kind of peruse and meet um, our program specialists, our program principals at each one of these vendor booths up tonight. That diversity that we offer in this district provides students an opportunity to uh, move out into their gifts, to their talents, whether it's over Wales APEC with our performance, or it's our IB or APEC programming, or even in our college programming where even at Jackson Middle College you can become a certified teacher in a few years. Our goal is to try to meet every scholar where they are and help them to find a home in one of our schools, in one of our programs. The J APS Special Programs Fair featured special performances by the Northwest Bailey Choir, the Jim Hill High School Band, the Forest Hill High School Band, the Wells Theater Department. For those lucky enough to have winning tickets, there were raffle prizes. All of this as um, kind of the, what we owe to the, the district and to the city. We owe them programs that are compelling, high quality, and ones that help our scholars find themselves in one or the other. Learn more about special programs offered at JPS. Contact the Office of Advanced Academics. JPS celebrates five outstanding Wells APAC Elementary School scholars who excelled in every subject earning prestigious recognition as inductees into the National Elementary Honor Society. We're gathered here to formally recognize those students who have been selected by the faculty and our school for successfully completing the first semester with an 85 or above average in each subject. There are four qualities that serve as a standard for scholars selected as National Honor Society inductees. We begin with scholarship. Scholarship, come forth. Scholarship denotes a commitment to learning. A student is willing to spend hours reading and studying. Service, come forth. Service is my office. Service can be established in the routine of the days of work, 
where many opportunities arise to help others, both at school and in the community. Leadership, come forth. Leadership. Leadership should exert a wholesome influence on the school. In taking initiative in the classroom and in school activities, the real leader strives to train and aid others to reach their common goals of success. Character, come forth. Character is the force within the individual that distinguishes each person from others. It creates for each of us our individuality, our goodness. It is that without which no one can respect oneself, nor hope to attain the respect of others. Each inductee was introduced by a parent. I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth Cantor. My name is Shannon Frost, the proud mother of Bo Daniel Frost. Madeline is a JPS student through and through. And she would not be here today without the hard work and dedication of the faculty, staff, and fellow students in the Jackson Public School System. I'm so proud to introduce my daughter, Rhea Hunter. Rhea is a fifth grade student here at Wells. Uh, my daughter, Jane, uh, she's more than deserving of being here, and I'm so, so, so proud of her. Special guest speaker, Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves, praised these young JPS scholars for their remarkable accomplishments. Behind the students being honored here today are teachers who have made a lasting impact on them. Teachers who have given them not just knowledge, but teachers who have given these young people the courage to chase their dreams and the confidence to make those dreams come true. I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I just want to say thank you to all the people who can make this happen. I'm really honored and I'm really happy and also really thankful for everybody who got me here. Governor Rees encouraged these honorees and all JPS scholars to continue striving for greatness. You can accomplish anything in life you want to accomplish. You just got to be willing to develop a plan, to dream big, and you got to be willing to work hard to accomplish whatever dreams you have before you. Congratulations to Elizabeth Cantor, Bo Frost, Madeline Hall, Rhea Hunter, and Jane Walker. Your achievements stand as a testament to your determination in your studies. In honor of National School Counseling Week, a celebration at the Capitol Towers Building in downtown Jackson, recognizing the unsung heroes of our educational system, the school counselors of Jackson Public Schools. Today, we celebrate who you are, the standard on which you base your work, and the focus you have on students as you walk in the ministry God has called you to do. The beautiful voices of the Callaway Chargers Choir kicked off the festivities. Songs paying tribute to Black History Month. The event was an opportunity to honor JPS counselors as outstanding educational support leaders who work tirelessly behind the scenes, shaping the future of our scholars. We service every day. We have to be the light for those around us. We are standards-based, student-focused counselors committed to working together. Now, what do we do? We score. The atmosphere was one of laughter and camaraderie, gratitude and appreciation. Keep on doing what you're doing, everyone. We love and appreciate you for all that you do for your scholars, your staff, and everybody. At the end of the day, when they come to us, we work them through a plethora of emotions that they're going through. Go to the office. <laughs> JPS counselors were recognized for their invaluable contributions. I can truly say that I am proud of the work that professional school counselors do. I've learned that we can emphasize that we can accomplish difficult tasks with support. And the highlight of the event, the announcement of the JPS Counselor of the Year. From Jim Hill, Dr. Edney Edna Stacks from Washington. This is a team award because we're family over at Jim Hill.
All JPS counselors are appreciated for their dedication, their passion, and their unwavering commitment to the success of our scholars. Did you know 1980 Murrah High School graduate Jeff Good is co-founder and owner of three of Jackson's most unique and successful restaurants? Jeff Good's success as a business owner and food and catering entrepreneur are the result of hard work and the passion for community service. Learn more about Jeff Good and see who else is a notable JPS alumni. Visit our website, jackson.k12.ms.us slash alumni. At JPS, we recognize and celebrate the parents and family members of JPS scholars. We understand the huge role parents and family members play toward the education of our scholars. What we want to do is just to empower you with information in order to become better parents as you hold us accountable for becoming better teachers, principals, and administrators as we serve you uh, in Jackson Public School District. JPS recently hosted the Parent and Family Engagement Homecoming. The beautiful harmonies of the Callaway Male Choral Group helped to kick off the evening. <laughs> and a dance battle between scholars, old school and new school. I'm the number one ranked middle school in our State, Northwest Jackson Middle School, Miss Linda Eubanks. Plus a number of recipients for the JPS Parent of the Year Award. A good parent, I support my children. To keep, keep them uh, encouraged, let them know they can do their best, strive for their best. Hundreds of parents passionate about education learned about programs and opportunities to bridge education between school and the community. We are here to give parents strategies and materials to help their children at home. The idea is for parents to attend a session, learn how to use these resources, and then walk away with those resources. We also have a lot of different booths from our community partners, and so they're sharing information relevant to parents as well. The Parent and Family Engagement Homecoming was an opportunity for families and educators to come together to begin the process of building relationships and to discover programs to empower JPS scholars for success. So today we have our senior college fair. We have over 75 departments and colleges from various colleges, community colleges throughout the state of Mississippi and even the southeastern region here to meet with our students. And so this gives our students the opportunity to meet with the college recruiters face to face, in person, and be able to learn who their college recruiter is, to learn more about the departments and the colleges being offered. Um, at the schools and just to see how they can get there and just have a pathway after graduation. It can kind of give us a little head start on the way that they operate instead of having to go up there and go and tour, but it also gives us the opportunity to network and be able to interact with people that are at the college so we can possibly get other opportunities that you wouldn't know about just by going on the website or going up to the college for a tour. Ask about rent money. How can this you go way, to you way, way, for long? I think it's important to show students their options. It's nice for them to see that there are so many things for them to do. There is not just one particular path to success, and that could be college, that could be the military, that could be trade school, um, but it's nice for them to be exposed and for them to know. I feel like it's important to get a head start because the more you know, the more you learn, and if I'm out here to learn about what college I'm going to, then I know which college is best fit the program that I'm interested in. So I feel as though it's needed for us to get on it as soon as we can because we don't want to wait to the last minute or the end of our senior year to be like, oh, now it's time to get to college, it's time to do this and the third. But like, I feel like we need to try our best to get to it now so that when it's time to actually go to college, we'll be already set.
Jackson Public School District is successful and moving in one direction, featuring several special programs. The APAC program at Wells, Bailey, and Murrah provides accelerated coursework, visual, and performing arts training for scholars in 4th through 12th grades. Casey, a Blue Ribbon Elementary School, infuses the arts into every subject. The JPS Tougaloo Early College High School allows scholars to begin college in the 9th grade. The Career Development Center features 20 career and technical education programs. Our International Baccalaureate program begins at Obama, the number one elementary school in Mississippi, and continues through Northwest Middle and Jim Hill High School. McWillie's Montessori program is where students' interests come to life. REAP offers an accelerated pathway to graduation that re-engages undercredited scholars in 8th through 12th grades. The new Jackson Middle College, in partnership with Jackson State University, allows... Sorry. We do, four is a form, and uh, Miss Figure's on the way. Mm -hmm. All right. Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Four members, we have four members present. Uh, Mr. Figures will be joining us shortly. Mrs. Thompson is not able to join us this evening. Um, we have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to, real quick, Mrs. Williams did the District, those are on there. Okay. Is there a motion to review? Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? I so move. Second. Mrs. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. We've all had an opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the February 6, 2024 minutes? So moved. Second. Dr. Hairston has moved. Mr. McGuffey has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. We'll uh, begin with our video highlights. Great. We're going to get started with that Growth Mindset Award. As we celebrate National School Counseling Week 2024, it's a joyous occasion right here in our own community. We honor you. We appreciate you and thank you so much. The recent luncheon served as a wonderful opportunity to commend and recognize the hard work and dedication of our JPS counselors. Everybody needs support, including all of you. So as you focus on students, remember to focus on yourselves. The recent luncheon served as a wonderful opportunity to commend and recognize the hard work and dedication of our JPS counselors. From Jim Hill, Dr. Edna among the deserving recipients, one outstanding counselor was singled out as the JPS Counselor of the Year. Thank you for all the long hours you work to ensure that the Tiger family are supported academically and most of all, emotionally. These are near peers for these students. And because they're near peers, these students will listen to them more. Uh, they're more relatable. It was an inspiring sight as JPS JROTC scholars teamed up with West Point military cadets for a series of enlightening workshops at the Mississippi East Center. We're super excited to teach them life lessons and uh, hopefully one day we might all see them at West Point. We're going to talk about some very key fundamental civil engineering principles. So no matter what it is, what position you have, you're going to be in a position of leadership. He still uphold his values and he was consistent on the high end. You don't have to follow someone if they're not doing well things right. Just do what's right, even when it's difficult. The workshops with a focus on STEM allowed scholars to collaborate in demonstrations and competitions. It's all about exposing our kids to science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. A showcase of talent and innovation at the Jackson Convention Center, where scholars from all corners of the JPS School District displayed their skills in science, technology, engineering, and math at the 2024 STEM Expo. The Expo was a bustling hub of creativity featuring a diverse range of exhibits where scholars eagerly shared the purpose and creativity behind their projects. Jackson Public Schools joined school districts across the state in recognizing the vital contributions of school boards. During School Board Recognition Week, February 18th through the 24th, we are exceedingly grateful to the faithful members of the JPS School Board for their devoted service to our community. 
For more information about Jackson Public Schools and Black History Month, visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Instagram at JPS Student Voices, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast Channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com slash jpsitv. As always, we want to thank our team for uh, their work in bringing us those highlights and reminders of what's been happening in Jackson Public Schools. I, um, I, I always sit here, each and every board meeting, I sit here with a great amount of pride, just remembering in some cases and even seeing um, in, in some cases, some other cases where I wasn't able to be there, um, all of the wonderful uh, programs and experiences and opportunities that our scholars uh, receive uh, throughout the, the school year. Um, we take to heart the importance of creating memorable learning experiences for our scholars. And so um, just, again, want to thank um, all of those who helped to make such wonderful experiences happen on a day, daily basis for our scholars. Uh, I thought uh, I'd share some important historical events as we pay special attention, <clears throat> excuse me, this month um, to black history. On May the 17th, 1954, the Supreme Court made a landmark decision, the U.S. Supreme Court made a landmark decision that forever changed the course of American education. The justices ruled that the separation of schools for black and white students was illegal. This monumental case, filed by Oliver Brown on behalf of his daughter Linda, was combined with similar cases and became known as Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. The case was argued by a formidable legal team led by Thurgood Marshall on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. The verdict overturned the separate but equal doctrine in the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson case. In the Brown case of 1954, um, the courts declared that the plaintiffs who were forced to attend separate equal schools were deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. In honor of the 1954 Supreme Court decision, now 70 years later, the National Coalition on Education Equity, NCOEE, will convene a conference in collaboration with several partners this year. This gathering will unite educational leaders, directors of community-based organizations, academics, and policymakers nationwide to deliberate on various critical issues. I'm honored to have been invited to participate in this historical event. Um, and it, uh, it aims to address some of the continued concerns through policy development and programmatic changes for the betterment of our scholars. Educators from all corners of the country will spearhead um, research related to the 1954 decision, its influence on our scholars and communities, and the path forward. Um, our insights will also be featured in a book published post-conference. This event will be held May the 22nd through the 24th of this year in uh, Washington, D.C. I'm really excited to be a part of this convening. I'm sure to learn a lot about um, you know, what was promised and what was intended in the court case and the, and the uh, ruling, and of course, how all of that has played out, um, and of course, to share our own experiences about um, what, we, what we continue to um, experience as a school district um, all these years later. Um, so that was our Black History moment. Great moment. <laughs> um, it's that time again, board members, community members. 
Uh, JPS seeks input from our stakeholders on the comprehensive needs assessment survey. The survey, this survey gathers multiple data points to help to identify the prioritized needs of our district, our, our schools, and our scholars and team members, actually. The data will assist schools in monitoring and assessing the impact of programs and instruction on uh, scholar achievement and against our strategic plan. In addition, data analysis will help to refine some of the current instructional practices within our schools. The survey will gather data in various dimensions, to, including uh, student achievement, curriculum and instruction, mental uh, wellness and, and, and other aspects of wellness and safety, professional development, and family and community engagement. We encourage all JPS parents, scholars, and team members to visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us um, or I believe scan that QR code that's being posted there uh, to take the survey. And the survey will close on Monday, March the 11th of 2024. One of the things that we heard um, not long after I, I got here, and I believe uh, it had been lifted up in one of the reports or a couple of the reports that were done in Jackson Public Schools was that we gathered this information, but there wasn't always a clear pathway forward. What did you hear? What, what did the uh, survey tell us? And so what pivots will you make? What things will you you know, fortify because folks said that this was something that they liked. And so we've worked really hard over the last few years to be much more transparent about the feedback that we got and the, um, the shifts that we've made as a result of some of the feedback and um, increased programming, increased focus in, in several areas. And, and I know there's more work to be done, but we do just want to keep encouraging our various stakeholders to engage with us through the survey and um, help us to see what seems to be working and, and what needs continued attention. Um, and especially as we're moving um, into this next uh, strategic plan um, development, we want to make sure that we've got uh, the most recent feedback from our, our various stakeholders. Hot off the press is the Jackson Public Schools annual report for school year 22-23. Uh, I believe it's linked on our website, is it not? Not yet? It will be. It's happening now. After the meeting, yes sir, after the meeting. Um, I'm really proud of this annual report. One, because we did such, so much really good work last year, and there's so much to tell. And it's such a wonderful story to tell about um, our continued march towards excellence. Um, so there's data there, there are um, various programs that are highlighted. It's, um, it's, there's just a lot of wonderful information. In addition, um, I have to say this is by far one of our very best reports. Our team, our public relations team, just they did such a wonderful job in working with our partners to uh, not only to share some good news about Jackson Public Schools, but to do it in a way that's, I, I believe, that's slick, that's eye-catching, um, lots of graphics. Um, it's just really, really well done. And so I want to give them a public uh, round of applause for their work. <laughs> Appreciate uh, Mr. Johnson and his team and, and, again, our partners for their work in, in doing this. And we see that we, we believe that we'll continue to continue to improve even on, on what we see here. So when you get a chance, please do take a look at our annual report and be reminded of some of the great things that we did last year and what we've got atop even this year as we continue. And lastly, board members, um, our board members of the Jackson Public Schools, uh, I'm pleased to join school districts across the state in recognizing the vital the critical contributions of our school board uh, during the school board recognition, recognition week, which is February the 18th through the 24th this week. On a personal note, I am grateful to work with this board, whose devotion and passion have shown in every thoughtful decision made at this table. 
My team and I have presented several items that were difficult um, and without simple or right answers. But in every challenging situation, uh, the best interests of our scholars and team members and the community have remained your top priority. Um, we want to thank you for your tireless efforts uh, to improve, to promote, to protect, and to just overall demonstrate your love for Jackson Public Schools and all of the members of this school community. And so thank you sincerely for everything you all have done. People can't know how much time, they, they will never know how much time you devote to Jackson Public Schools um, and how much you give of your smarts, of your resources, sacrifice from your families, how much you give of your networks to a person each of you has extended all of, in all of these ways uh, to help improve um, our service to our scholars and families and to the community. So thank you, sincerely, thank you. I tell my friends across the country, <laughs> I'm so glad I'm where I am because when I see some of their school board videos on TikTok <laughs> and whatnot, <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm so glad I'm not there. Um, so sincerely thank you. And with that, Dr. Seaback, I turn the meeting back over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Green. and. Um, what does Jim Harbaugh say from the University of Michigan? Who's got it better than us? Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. All right. Um, had to take us out of the South for a second there. But uh, um, thank you, Dr. Green, sincerely. It's, I think every one of us would agree it's a privilege to serve on this board um, with you at, at the helm. And so um, let's move. Yes, ma'am. It is our dedicated pleasure to serve Thank you. this group. Yes. And we appreciate all of the things that you and your team do. Great job that you do. So we want to congratulate you all also for the work that you do. It's a love fest up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hilliard. All right, board members, um, we do not have any public comments tonight, um, but I would remind um, our, our, our viewers and our attendees um, that community members who would like to make public comments should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at roswilliams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 on the day of the meeting. All right, so let's move on to our information only items. Our first uh, update will come from Mr. Bowen uh, from Triage Facility Consultants. He will provide the ESSER 3 update. Good to see you all this evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with you all. We appreciate the opportunity to give you an update. Um, I have with me um, Mr. Devin, uh, Devin, I was going to start the presentation for us real quick. Good evening. Good to see all of you again. Uh, once again, our update is from December 16th to 20, January 15th, 2024. So keep that, that in mind. So, of course, our topic is going to address project updates, scheduling, as well as any budget updates. All right, so our first project is Powell Middle School. Things are going well at Powell. All the windows have made it on site and they have been installed. Currently, we were at 67.3% at the time. Uh, you see there that the con contract completion date was January 20th. There will be a change order pending. Based on the pay apps and conversation with the architects and the contractors, we are expecting this project to be completed by March 7th of 2024. So we're excited about that at Powell. Our next project is going to McLeod <coughs> Elementary. Uh, here at the 15th, we were at 49.6% complete. 
Uh, the mill work, it is complete in the bath, in the restrooms, in all the classrooms. You see here the plumbing rough ends. We're happy to announce we have a partial substantial completion on those restrooms. So those are actually, actually being used at the school. 49.6% okay. uh, complete. There's a change order pending again due to some uh, equipment delays and weather. That project should be done by March 7th as well, ironically. All right, Pecan Park. We're really excited about Pecan Park. It's one of our major projects. Uh, here we see the waterproofing being completed as we prepare for the exterior finishes at the school. There's tons of work going on. We have to report this project is moving along at 29.5% completion at the time. We recently had a change order that was approved. As we said, contractors are working to have the school ready for scholars and staff by July 15th, and all works will be done by August 31st. Board and Green, very happy to report this project was complete ahead of schedule. It is substantially complete and the punch list has been taken, taken care of. So this project has been turned back over to the school district. We're really excited about the construction <coughs> here at Board and Green. The Career Development Center, 2%. Uh, we have encountered demolition of, of the stairwell, HVAC ducts, and the architects and contracts are ready to begin the next portion of this project. It only at 2%, but things are rolling along very well at CDC. We're excited about what that project should look like for our students and scholars and staff. Jim Hill, really excited that this project is on schedule. We haven't had really any issues at all. 51.9%. We see here pictures of steel pipe being installed, copper pipes being installed, hooking up uh, the fan core units, and this project is going along rather smoothly at Jim Hill. Bailey APEC, our big project here, $17 million project. There's a lot of work going on at Bailey. We're really excited about the progress, and when we go there, what we see going on, uh, installation of HVAC duct work, you have ceiling tile been installed, a new roof, which is really, really important, and we're at 27.1% completion on this project. And last but not least, package B. Uh, that's going to be Callaway, Kirksey, North Jackson, and McWillie. Contractors have started work at Kirksey Middle School, and we are excited about the beginning of the project here. Uh, we're just waiting on some of the HVAC equipment, but so far everything is on pace to be completed on time. Uh, we are excited to announce these substantially completed projects at Wells APEC, Boyd Elementary with a restroom with an HVAC, Whitton Middle School, John Hopkins, and Boyd and Green Elementary, the, rental, the window replacements, and our awarded projects as of January 15th have restrooms and HVAC air quality upgrades at Casey Elementary in Northwest Middle, as well as Esther HVAC at Casey Galloway Span Elementary and Whitton Middle School. So at this time, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, board members, questions, comments? Sounds good. <laughs> Love to hear that. Um, I did have a question. It's associated with a board action later in the um, agenda. It's around the rejection of the Jim Hill bid for windows and restroom renovations of $2.5 million. And um, it's, how does that affect the project completion? Well, actually, it will not affect the project completion. What we found out is that the windows may not necessarily be as bad as we thought. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're really efficient in, uh, in making sure that that project goes properly, but it should not affect uh, the, the completion of the project. In most cases, projects like that are done a, one, a set of wonders at a time. So even if school is going on, you may use the use of that room until that day is done. So. Yeah. Can you go back to the Jim Hill yes. project? And the uh right the, that this bid is not that has that's, to do yeah, with it's that separate bid. from yes. this from that. yes okay. yes so separate okay. project that right to do with it. And, and so yes exactly what you said and um we're still confident that that we'll be able to open school and and all those things yes sir not as an not I'm sorry, let me back up. That this project with the windows will not impede us from opening school. We'll be able to work around scholars. We are, I will say, we are looking at some other projects that we may need to do, and we'll have to work through timing of those. Mm -hmm. um, but glad to see this one is on, on, right on, on, on point, yes, on schedule, because this is huge. And these other projects, we'll have to figure out timing for those and when they can 
when they can work on those. Okay. Yes. Thank you for Thank you, um, distinguishing between the two. I may have another question when we get to that part of the yep. um, agenda. I've got um, just real quick. Uh, one's a question. One's sort of a comment that I wanted to acknowledge. Um, the first one is on Pecan Park. Do we have? Uh, I'm always interested in, that, in observing as these things go. Do we have um, rough schedules for when the facade, when that's actually that work is going to be done? I know they've done the rough ends and everything, and they're ready to start that. Do we know when that's going to start happening? The go ahead, Devin. So according to the contractors, that is going to be the last aspect of construction because our main focus is getting scholars inside and yeah. staff ready. We yeah. know that's a huge press for July. Uh, as a former employee of JPS, I know <laughs> how that goes. We need to be in school. So the contracts, are, we're very confident in their ability to make sure that the school is ready for students and they'll be able to do all the exterior work, make sure it's safe and there won't be any issues for the scholars. And that deadline is August 31st. And I will tell you that the exterior is moving, they are moving aggressively yeah. on the exterior. Have you been by there? I've driven by. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They're moving aggressively. So, so, and just to distinguish, there's, um, there's continued exterior work right. on, the, yes, on the site That's that, that will be done. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking specifically the Sorry, building. the actual facade. Yeah. 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 That's just one of those, I mean, I'm, I'm very mindful um, Given the given the benefit that I had, frankly, I think of working with our facilities group prior to being on the board, and knowing how, how important it is for us to communicate the work that's being done, I yes. can tell you, it's amazing when we get to put in new duct work and new pipes <laughs> and all those things. But and no one notices. <laughs> <laughs> So they're really important. So I'm just always interested in those sort of public-facing aspects of those projects. So that, that's the impetus for the question. Um, the second comment I just wanted to make, um, I wanted to give a shout-out to Ms. Franklin and Ms. Robinson for showing me around. Uh, I went to Bailey uh, during the day, and I think there were probably, when you all say there's a lot of work going on, I, I genuinely think there were about 70 workers out there when I was there, yes. maybe more. I mean, who yes. knows? But they're touching every part of that building. And, and so um, I just want to say thanks for, to both the facilities group and to you all for yes. um, kind of all of that, um, the, the management, task management. I know how hard it is to keep all of that stuff on track. Um, and so I, I just really appreciate the work that's going on there. That building is important for lots of reasons, um, but it's going to be, it's a real gem. So thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. To Mr. McGuffey's point, I'm going to ask, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Ms. Robinson and Mr. Johnson, um, we should circle back around to uh, how we're communicating the progress even to date. Is there, again, to your point, when we're doing duck work, that's one thing. Folks often don't see it um, as important as it is. Incredibly important. Um, and, but, and add to that, some of these buildings, several of these buildings, um, we're doing the work with the scholars not there. And so just redoubling our efforts to communicate and show a lot of the uh, progress that's happening, that's something I'd like to circle back on. Okay. You this is related to Pecan Park. I looked at you because it's in your, your ward. We may even think uh, uh, or consider for Pecan Park and Bailey community open houses. Agreed. Um, yeah. Did yeah. somebody capture that? Excellent idea. Did somebody capture that? Okay, thank you. Great. I, no, I'm just leaning up to say thank you. We appreciate all the work and continued updates. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Next um, board members, we have our student board member presentation. And tonight, Mrs. Lakeisha Marshall Thomas, our assistant superintendent from the high school division, will introduce our scholar from the Jackson Tulu Early College High School. Great evening, Good Dr. Sevag, board members, Dr. Green, JPS family and friends. Um, tonight we have our student school board representative um, policy presentation. It's um, by Mr. Jerry Palmer. 
Jerry is a senior at JPS Tougaloo Early College High School. Jerry's future aspirations are to attend the University of Mississippi to pursue a career in clinical psychology or industrial and organizational psychology. He says that he is very excited about being on the board because he's able to use his platform to let the students' voices become heard by the board. He also feels it's a great experience to put on his resume. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, Jerry Palmer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Jerry Palmer, and I am a senior at the JPS Tougaloo Early College High School. And the policy I chose was the staff involvement in policy making. Currently, the policy states that all employees are encouraged to participate in the development of policies for the school system. Employees, employees are encouraged to give oral or written suggestions in all, in all areas of the school activities to the superintendent. The board may, but is not required to accept such suggestions. My personal thoughts about the um, about the policy now, I feel like the staff should have a definite uh, a definite seat at the table because they are the ones in the classroom, and they are the ones the policies most times directly affect them as the employers, and I feel like if if they had a seat at the table, this would improve the quality of their job and the quality of the learning for students as well. Um, these were some pros and cons that I came up with while researching this matter. Um, I'm gonna start with the cons. Um, for cons, they, teachers could, well, they may have a limited expertise in, in administration. Um, areas such as like finances and resources, they may not have much experience or in like making policies about these things or things such as conflicts of um, interest where they could like have, problem, have problems when they were, um, I'm sorry, let me slow down. <laughs> okay, all right. Or conflicts of interest where teachers could have problems where, when making policy decisions where, um, when considering things like pay or their work conditions and these get in, in the way of their um, decision making skills. And for pros, I, had, I put the insider perspective. Like I said earlier, teachers are in the classroom so they would have first hand experience of these policies and seeing if they will be effective in the classroom or not even. Um, it would be better communication between educators and administration as well. And then um, overall job satis satisf satisfaction and, and um, job morale. Right. Other school districts takes um, Hines, Hines County district policy says that any board member or any individual of the group, a group of students, um, students, civilians, or employees may propose and write new policies or changes to, to these existing policies. The policy proposals shall be referred to the superintendent or examination prior to the board's discussion. And then I interviewed a host of students across the districts, and these were the questions that I had for them. And, um, yeah. um, this is one I want to highlight where it says, I think that the quality of education will be enhanced. Teachers are the ones who are doing a hard job and on the grounds with these students. If they had a voice when it came to making decisions, this could lead to the enhancement of education. This also makes them feel empowered and appreciated. And this is important when considering issues with pay surrounding employees, I mean educators. Mm -hmm. So when they feel that their voices are being heard and that they play a vital role in the district, they teach with a better attitude in a certain area about themselves, improving the quality of education, basically. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of, uh, one student also said that it seemed like the, um, the higher ups or the board focused mostly on numbers when it came to observing schools. And when looking at the actual quality of the teachers, teaching, teaching skill basically, they, they felt like this was mostly determined based on like test scores or things such like that. And this was the last response. And then I interviewed a host of teachers across the district as well. Um, to, to summarize it up, teachers basically, they had um, mixed emotions about this. A lot of them felt that they were both positive and negative effects like I did. Um, First hand, they thought that um, they would have the experience to inform on these policies and advocate for them. And then there were also concerns, like I said earlier, about like conflict of interest, such as prioritizing their own interests or needs when making um, policy decisions. 
and but opinions do vary, and a lot a lot of them appreciate it as a chance to a chance for teachers to give feedback on the impactful policies. This is a recommended policy revision that I had, and I think that um, teachers should have a similar system of representation of students. The board could select a, could select and interview a few teachers from from the principals and recommendations across the district and give them a provisional seat at the board for the school year. Also, teachers should come from the high, middle, and elementary schools of JPS, so basically teacher representatives on the board. Mm -hmm. And I was informed that there are teacher administrative and student advisory teams that meet with the superintendent, but I'm not sure if these have any effect on the policies. But if they, if they, if they do, it would be a great idea to share with schools when policy changes are made. And that's my presentation. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Board members? <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Sivak. Having served on the policy committee, uh, I know I appreciate your comments. Mm -hmm. And um, there is perhaps a way we could integrate and welcome some of the recommendations that you made. Uh, it might be a little harder on the teachers because our policy committee meetings are usually during the school day. But it is something legitimate that we at least need to uh, discuss. <clears throat> and if teachers couldn't, <clears throat> excuse me, couldn't attend meetings, or we couldn't find a time that would be acceptable for all, perhaps there is a way that we could um, have teacher input, you know, write the chair of the policy committee or whatnot. So thank you so much for your comments. Other questions? Um, thank you, Mr. Palmer. Um, it definitely, it definitely gives us something to think about. The, um, I was struck by the comment around the advisory committees. I was glad you actually went there because that's the first place I went. I know we um, have advisory committees, and so could you speak a little more about the point of? basically them not having much, well, um, it, it, they're advisory versus governance, so there's a difference between the two, and um, are there th thoughts about how we can leverage those more deeply, particularly when it comes to policy making, or um, are there different feedback loops? Mr. Dr. Hairston referenced the policy committee, um, which is a public meeting. Uh, I'm also curious to get your so I'll just there's that's one question is what's your what's your if you could just speak a little bit more to to um, the le actual levels of influence that an advisory committee has relative to, to governance. Uh, as far as the advisory teams, I'm not really sure how those work, but I'm sure um, I'm sure they would. Do, are they let known about the policies being created? The advisory teams. Say it again. The advisory teams are they like let known about the policies? that you're creating or like, I don't know how that meeting will go. They are, they are, but not, that it could absolutely be highlighted more um, is the answer. It could absolutely be highlighted more, so. And like I was saying further, that could like um, transform or it's like when I was saying in my, rec in my own revision, when I was saying that um, they could have them sit in on the meetings and stuff, and things of that matter, they can, you can like, it, you don't have to create a new system. You can basically use your advisory teams mm -hmm. and implement certain things when you are uh, creating board policies and have them sit in and uh, like have a chance to voice their opinions on the policies. Yeah. <clears throat> the only thing we'd have to consider is that policy committee often meets during the school day. The school day. <laughs> so we'd have to figure out a way yeah. so that you, our students aren't deprived of the richness of their school day while the policy committee mm -hmm. is meeting. So, yes, but other than that, I mean, I'm, it's something that we could discuss and work through. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Green, I know you may have a question or two. Uh, as he all, he's usually gets the last question for our students. Oh. So <laughs> bring us home, Dr. Green. Okay. I, I actually, one, I just want to lift up um, how awesome it is that we have a scholar standing here presenting on a policy um, opportunity for us to increase
teacher voice in our district. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to just make sure that we fully appreciate that. I think that's pretty awesome. Because you could have said more about the, the scholar voice and more opportunities for your voices to be lifted up or to find their way into actual policy or administrative procedures. Um, and, and there, I'm sure, is a need and opportunity there. So I just wanted to appreciate that. Second thing, um, I want to call out that um, I appreciated you sharing both the, some of the feedback from scholars and from some teachers. Um, it was interesting that it seemed really, that, that scholars were really clear on, yeah, we've got to make this happen. And teachers were like, mm, <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe if, and so, and I think that just kind of surfaces the, the nuances of um, there's a need and, and the pathway forward, the, the how matters, and so, and I know that's riddled throughout your presentation here. I think in, in terms of a question, though, um, you know, as you know, w we have teachers, we have principals, we have cafeteria workers, we have school bus drivers, we have accountants, HR specialists, we have automotive specialists, we have HVAC um, technicians, on and on and on. We've got, we, this is a major business of sorts. There's, a, there's probably every aspect of operating. We've got attorneys on and on. And so my question to you is, while I don't disagree that we should be looking at opportunities for teachers, are you not concerned about the lack of voice for other team members directly into policy making? Uh, at the moment, my current passion was teachers, um, and like you said, I was, at first I did think about maybe students, but I felt like us, we, it, it could be more done, but I felt like now, I feel like teachers should have the stand or take a stand. I feel like mm -hmm. I should take the stand for them at the moment. Um, as far as the other areas, I feel somebody should come after me and advocate for them as well, but yeah. today I'm here for the teachers. Understood. <laughs> Heard. Heard and appreciated. Um, heard and appreciated. Um, yeah, I, I, this is compelling to me. I don't, I don't know what the way forward is, and you know, we'll have to have some more discussion on, on that very thing. And um, yeah, you know, I've got some thoughts even about like the selection of scholars, and so what would that look like for teachers? And, and but these are things that we could figure out. And then what is the role? Because you all don't have a, a voting, you don't have voting rights as, as scholar representatives. I didn't hear you say it, but are you contemplating teachers having voting rights yeah, on the board? Rights, yeah. Full rights? Yeah, like actually mm -hmm. sitting in when y'all make a the seat. Mm -hmm. revise them. So those are all things that, um, you know, should we go down that road would, would require some policy changes and and um, whatnot. Way to bring the heat. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I will. I'll just end with. I I do want to lift up. I think there's a need across the board there to look at how our voices, all voices within JPS, in and around JPS, lifted up. What are the models that we see in other places? We don't have to recreate the wheel all on our own. There are other districts, whether in the state or outside of the state, that, that have other models that we might look at as well, um, where scholar representatives, teacher, repre teacher or staff representatives, par parent representatives are actually seated on the board as representatives. So those are some other thoughts. But I appreciate what you brought. Mm -hmm. Very compelling. And I appreciate y'all, too, as the board, for what y'all have done and the things that you will continue to do. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Very compelling. All right. And Mr. Palmer, we actually have a policy discussion coming up <laughs> on our agenda right now.
Uh, I'll invite uh, Attorney Harris up, um, who will take us through a review of policies for amendment and creation. Attorney Harris. Good evening, Board President Dr. Seebeck, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Green, Community. The Office of the General Counsel is recommending that the Board of Trustees review the following amendments and creation of policies. The first amendment is GACN, Sexual Harassment Procedures. Um, this policy was updated to correct a few grammatical errors. The second policy is GBEJ, Leaving Contract Prior to Final Date of Contract. That policy as well was updated to correct some grammatical errors. Policy IDB, Accreditation. We updated this policy to provide some more context around the procedures we use to address our corrective action plan around accreditation. The next policy that's up for amendment is policy JCG, membership in fraternities, sororities, and secret societies. Okay, we updated this policy to make a, I call it a grammatical uh, change. We were listed in this policy as the Jackson Municipal, the separate municipal school district. And so we are not that anymore. We're the Jackson Public School District. So we updated it to reflect that name. But as Dr. Green was speaking in his superintendent's report, his remarks, um, he talked about Brown versus Board of Education. I was thinking about when we were the separate municipal school district. And that was a case brought 10 years after Brown versus Board in 1964 to address the inequities and the um, segregation that was still existing in our district. Um, to answer some of the questions that were, po that were posed, um, I'm not sure what the basis for the creation of this policy was because this policy has existed in our district since 1980 is when it was created. But we did um, want to update it to reflect the current name of the school district as well as it's based on uh, a law that's still in effect that states that any public high school fraternity, sorority, or secret society um, is a nip inimical to public free schools and therefore unlawful and therefore we still have the, we still have this policy and for your information there have been some recent um, issues with fraternity sorority like activities um, perpetrated by staff members but involving students so this policy is still relevant and important today the next policy that's up for amendment is policy ka school community relations goals and that policy as well was updated to correct some grammatical errors within the policy and then we have a policy that we're recommending for creation. The Chief Operations Officer and the Office of the General Counsel is recommending creation of the policy, a policy surrounding banning individuals from district properties and activities. Um, there were some questions surrounding whether this policy exists in other school districts. I'm not sure if this specific policy exists in Mississippi school districts. However, it does, um, the practice exists, I know. But the policy does exist in other districts in various states. Um, I found a policy in New Mexico, Tennessee, California, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Texas. And as far as districts within Mississippi, Rankin County, Mississippi does have a public conduct policy that briefly addresses um, denying visitation to district property and trespassing. <laughs> and so um, although MSBA was not consulted in the creation of this policy, they are aware of it and they are creating a code for us to use in the event that the board approves the policy so that we can um, place it on our site. Regarding the two levels of approval for this um, policy that we have suggested, we really want to make sure that these decisions are fair and equitable across the entire district. And so leveling up from from not allowing just a school principal by themselves or uh, a head of a department by themselves to make it to make a decision, but to level up to their supervisor it gives us some greater oversight, like a bird's eye view, so that we can make sure we're acting the same. We're treating everybody equitably across the district, and so that's why we have those two levels of <laughs> approval. And as far as any. Um, notification for the communications department. I mean, if an issue arises, I suggest that we handle it on a case-by-case -case basis. It's certainly not something that we will be broadcasting. Um, it's more of an, an inline process to handle any rowdy spectators or visitors that we might have to ensure the safety of district scholars and um, personnel. So those are our recommendations for the amendment of those various policies and the creation of that one policy. Great. Thank you, Attorney Harris. Uh, board members, are there any questions, comments? <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for running through all the questions as well. Yes, um, Dr. Next. Dr. Seaver. Yes, Dr. Harrison. Could I make a comment uh, regarding the name 
of the Jackson Municipal Separate School yes. District. If I'm not mistaken, the separate was in our name because we were separate from Hines County. At that time, you know, the schools were segregated, but the separate refers to being separate from Hines County. Mm. So I'll, I'll research that and look that up to be sure, but I knew that was something that bothered me as a young person coming up until I real learned after research that it refers to being separate from uh -huh. Hines County. But the schools were segregated, mm -hmm. but they were separate from Hines County. Okay. Well, another piece of it is you have countywide school districts, and then when you have separate school districts that were carved out for certain municipalities, I mean, there's a section in the Mississippi Code, so they were called municipal separate school districts. Mm -hmm. So Clinton, for instance, would be a municipal separate school district because it's a city within Hines County and not part of the countywide district. So you had this across all the counties that didn't have countywide school districts or consolidated school districts. There are all sorts of different kinds of school districts that were created in the Mississippi Code. So municipal separate school districts were just those that were confined within the geographical boundaries of a city and weren't encompassed in a countywide school mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Thank you, Attorney Turner. Um, all right, next we will move on to a review of our school improvement benchmark results. Uh, Dr. Regini Scott, our Executive Director of School Support, will present the information. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Dr. Sivak, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Green, and JPS family. The Jackson Public School District Office of School Support presents for information purposes only for school year 23-24 school improvement updates for schools that are identified as comprehensive support and improvement, targeted support and improvement, and additional targeted support and improvement. Captured in each report, you will find the following. Overall school proficiency goals, benchmarks one and two assessment proficiency results, student enrollment and attendance data, and disciplinary infractions data. Schools will detail next steps to address areas of challenge presented by the data. District supports will also be shared to assist the schools in addressing school improvement needs. And now I will go into the presentation. <coughs> I think I have already started clicking. Okay. So for the work that we do in the Office of School Support that's for our schools um, identified for support and improvement, our core values and commitments that we support directly are equity and ensuring that all students have access to meet their unique needs, um, to access to resources, as well as ensuring that there are resources available to provide innovative teaching and learning. Okay, user error. Oh. I got it, thank you. Okay. All right, so my presentation goals for today is to provide an overview of the school improvement identifications, to provide you with a list of exited and identified schools for the past few years, to discuss the supports and responsibilities for our schools, district staff, and the MDE, and to provide you with a list of next steps. So our school improvement identifications can be federal or state identifications. For federal, schools can be identified for comprehensive support and improvement, which we call CSI. And there's an additional layer for any CSI schools that have been re-identified, and they will receive more rigorous options or interventions. Target support and intervention, target support and improvement support, and then additional targeted support and improvement support. And for our state identification, schools can be identified as a school at risk or SAR if their, their performance rating is an F. So when we're talking about the federal identification of CSI, um, schools can be identified if they are a high school with a graduation rate of 67% or less, and that is just based on the previous year's accountability data or 
if a school is in the lowest 5% of all Title I schools, and that is based on an average of that three-year accountability score for that school, or a school can be identified if they have been identified for additional targeted support and improvement for three consecutive years. Once a school has been identified as CSI, they remain for a three-year cycle. So I mentioned that for those schools um, underneath CSI, there's an additional layer of support. When we talk about more rigorous options, or MRO, these are schools that have been previously identified for comprehensive support and improvement, and they did not come out of the identification after that three-year period. And there are just two additional requirements that these schools have to meet. The first is um, they have to implement activities that meet the highest two levels of evidence, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And they also have to provide evidence that they've actually implemented these activities. So when we get to a point of planning what they're going to implement in those schools, we have to make sure that those activities are evidence-based and we can show that they actually did these things. So the next um, area where they can be identified is targeted support and improvement. Now this is based on subgroup performance. And so in that yellow box there, you see the different um, groups um, that they're identifying for support. So these can be students from major racial or ethnic groups. These can be students who are um, disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged. These can be our students with disabilities and our English learners. And so a lot has to happen in order for students, for schools to be identified for targeted support and improvement. One, the subgroup has to perform in the 50% or low when it comes to the overall accountability index. And um, that score has to be in the lowest quartile when we talk about a three-year average of their gap to go. So for MDE, they set a goal on where students should be performing. And so where our students, that subgroup actually performs, that's where they are, the gap to go, that difference. They actually look for a three-year average of that gap to go performance. And the lowest quartile of a three-year improvement towards that gap to go. So all three of these things have to happen for a subgroup to be identified. And once all of these subgroups, these schools are listed, they are in the bottom 5% of all subgroups that are low performing. TSI schools are identified annually. Okay, so when we talk about additional targeted support and improvement, it's just a subset of the TSI schools that I just explained. It too deals with subgroup performance. This is based on three-year average subgroup performance. So it's not um, just the previous year um, and, um, well, this is the three-year average of the subgroup uh, performance at or below that of all the lowest 5% Title I schools. So. These are also identified annually. So we have a lot to celebrate in our district um, when it comes to our exited schools, and there's a lot of work to be done in our identified schools. So when we look at the list of uh, previously identified schools, starting with school year 1920, um, we had 22 schools identified for support and improvement, and that decreased each year down to 20 in school year 2021. 19 in school year 21-22, 13 for last school year, and this school year we have seven schools that were identified for support and improvement. And because Brinkley is closed, that number is actually six. Um, although the students at Brinkley went to Lanier, when they look at the overall performance with those students counted, that Lanier is no, not in the lowest 5% of all Title I schools um, for an, a three-year average. So Lanier did not take on the CSI designation for Brinkley. Okay. So we want to talk, we, we want to look at what was done in some of our schools. I think I went two slides. I did. Okay. So the schools that were exited just this year are for CSI, Chastain, Jim Hill, Lanier and Oak Forest, and then under ATSI, Forest Hill, 
and peoples. And so we want to look at what they did in those schools so that we can hopefully replicate some of those activities so that more of our schools will continue to exit um, under the uh, identification. Um, so for Chastain, that principal hired an additional interventionist to implement the MTSS process. And so they targeted the lowest performing students there. At Lanier, a counselor was hired for the same purpose, but that counselor also provided social emotional learning support for those students. And both of these schools were CSI, so they targeted the majority of the students, uh, but specifically um, those lowest performing students. Then at Forest Hill, they were identified for ATSI, and that's for their students with disabilities. And that principal hired a graduation coach and um, they began tracking scholars and making sure that there were post-secondary pathways, um, but they made sure to prioritize the, the students with disabilities. And they also provided professional development to their teachers to ensure that they were meeting the needs of these students. So for this year, our identified schools are Blackburn, which is CSI and MRO, so they are receiving the, the additional more rigorous options. Uh, Brinkley, which is closed, Powell, Cardozo, and Witten, they are all CSI MRO as well. Then we have Wingfield that has been identified as CSI. Wingfield was previously identified, and last year um, they were not, but this year they've uh, come on, so that's why you see them as re identified. And then Kirksey has been identified for the students with disabilities subgroup, so they are TSI. <laughs> and so we do have to provide supports and responsibilities um, at the school level, district, and from the MDE. And this chart just gives you an overview of the different supports and who will be providing that. And so um, all of our schools have to complete um, the comprehensive needs assessment. That's just where we identify the needs of the students, the staff, and um, we use that information as we develop the plan in MCAPS, which is the third column over. So all schools are responsible for that. The MDE um, conducts uh, a process where they interview principals and district leaders, and so that was for all MRO schools. So Powell, Witten, Blackburn, and Cardozo had to participate in that, and we don't have any SAR schools, but if we had one um, or some, they would have had to go through that process as well. The 20% Title I reservation, that is a requirement for all schools. When we complete the Title I um, plans, we have to make sure that there are some activities identified that's going to meet the needs of um, the students or the subgroups uh, that have been identified for additional support. Funding is provided for all CSI, TSI, and ATSI schools. Professional learning opportunities are available. The MDE provides coaching support, but only to the MRO schools. So those four schools that I listed, Cardozo, Witten, Blackburn, and Powell, those are the schools getting the on-site coaching support from the MDE. And then virtual checkpoints. That is something that we do at the district level where we put the plans in place and we check in with them at different points throughout the year to make sure that we're on track to implement the activities, and if not, then we look at where revisions need to be made. So here's the funding methodology that the MDE uses to award um, funding. If a school is identified as CSI, they will get 100,000, that's base. ATSI and TSI get 40,000, and there's no additional funding for SAR schools. If the MDE has additional funds, then all students of all schools that have been identified, they look at the total number of students and they come up with a PPA to distribute the remaining funds. So I spoke to you about the additional requirement for our MRO schools. Evidence. Um, there are three levels of evidence that all of our schools have to meet for the activities they're implementing, but the MRO schools have to implement the top two levels strong and moderate. What that means is these are, uh, this is evidence where there's um, a well-designed study or um, a, a partial study that was done where we can uh, attribute whatever growth we've seen in student performance to that intervention. So strong and moderate are the two levels of evidence that we have to implement. 
Okay, so this is just a copy of the board updates. You have the uh, one where I've put in the data, but this is what it looks like, and this is what you will get uh, for, for the this month through the end of June when I bring the monthly board updates. It will just be us updating you, whether it's on the benchmark assessments or any uh, discipline or attendance data, whatever's new for that month. That's page two. And so for our next steps, um, we will have to complete the comprehensive needs assessment. We'll look at what the students' needs are, staff needs are, and then the principals, <coughs> we will make decisions on what they will um, implement in their schools using the allocations. And we actually got them on Friday afternoon, so we know how much funding is available for those schools. And we have to utilize um, all the information gathered through our needs assessment to develop a plan of improvement for each of those schools. So we did get a few uh, questions uh, prior to the meeting. I'll go ahead and read those and the responses. So the first question asked, how do the proficiency trends from benchmark one to benchmark two correspond to the trends for school improvement schools from benchmark one to benchmark two proficiency from last year? So last year, um, when we're looking at the number of schools uh, that increased from benchmark one to benchmark two in ELA or reading and math, last year we had three schools to increase and three schools to decrease in their performance in reading. And we had none of our schools to increase in math. They all decreased mm -hmm. in that area. That was last year. But for this year, um, for reading from benchmark one to benchmark two, two of our schools increased four of them decrease, and the same for math, two increase, and four of them decrease. The second question we got was, what additional resources are needed from the board to move the four middle schools reporting single-digit proficiency in math to achieve their goals in the current school year? The board has already graciously uh, approved one vendor through RFP 2023-17 instructional coaching support and math tutoring support for middle schools in school improvement. This will provide lead partner support to middle school students in the form of small group tutorial sessions. The administration, administration is also leveraging school improvement funds to increase the number of lead partner support days available to our teachers. And then the last question we received, are there investments needed in the elementary schools that feed into middle schools in school improvement to move the schools permanently out of this status? While federal school improvement funding cannot be used to support the elementary feeder schools, we do believe that our investments in professional development for math instruction will have a positive impact on the transition of students um, from upper elementary to middle school. Based on the data, we see some impact on the transition from upper elementary to middle school. I'm sorry, I read that again. Based on the data, we see some consistent regression between the fifth and sixth grades. We plan to offer our math teacher institute for a second year this summer, and while there are, where there will be explicit time to work between transitional grades. This targeted focus should prepare teachers to better tackle the transition to middle school. And finally, we are working to address the sy systemic challenges of the teacher shortage in this critical area. Two promising long-term strategies include the introduction of our international educators to teach STEM courses and our Grow Your Own initiative through the Jackson Middle College program at Jackson State University. Right. Are there additional questions? Thank you, Dr. Scott. Board members, are there additional questions, comments? I, I do want to lift up the, um, the progress. I really appreciate you sharing the, the bar chart from 2019 to today. Um, I, I can remember when we would get the board reports where there would be 20 plus schools, and so getting down to six is a huge accomplishment. And so definitely want to lift that up. Um, I do, I also remember, I feel like we used to have to attend board meetings with, or not board, meetings with MDE. Is that no longer a requirement? Yeah, that, well, that is a requirement, well, not a requirement, but there are some people on, that are listed they that they would like to attend those meetings, and um, the board president is one. 
Okay. Yes. Sounds like you have work to do. <laughs> uh, I look forward to getting the invitation. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, board members, any other questions? Did you have yeah, Okay, Dr. Green. Okay. Oh, you have a question. Mr. McGuffey, are you? Yeah, I, I mean, I just, uh, it's something that got highlighted here, and I just, I, I just want to lift it up and kind of just get a general impression, either from you, from you, from people, is just, um, the work that has been done and that is being done and what are the what are the new thoughts i know we said yeah. looking at, L at middle schools in particular um in some ways i feel like i'm the outsider who y'all have been working on this and like you said that that's an immense pro progress over time and it deserves to be applauded and yet we have to do the hard things and say man these middle schools are can be stuck in a rut at times and so I'm just wondering um, the 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 math teacher um, initiative over the summer like what did we see out of that that was measurable a measurable benefit year one year two are we optimistic about that moving into this year I mean what do, what's going on yeah I, I'll, I'll take a stab and then um, I ask Dr. Evans to join us as the assistant soup for middle schools to speak a bit more about what she's been seeing, what she's been um, coaching and um, supporting principals on and, and even marshalling other respond, other um, resources. Um, I don't know that I can specifically, and maybe Dr. Evans can, I don't know that I can specifically speak to the last question there, what are we seeing from the summer work with math teachers? <clears throat> but um, our our math teacher shortage um, was, I think we still have, so do we still have any shortages, math teachers? Very few. At the start of this year, our math teacher shortage was unreal. Um, unreal. Um, and, and, you know, we were working through getting the international teachers. It took a little longer than we expected, but Thankfully, we've gotten um, almost 50 or right at 50 of them in, many of them in the math, math and science classes, many of them going to, most of them going to um, middle and, and high schools. And so that in and of itself is huge for us, just that we didn't have teachers um, in some schools with multiple math teacher shortages. And, you know, schools were doing their very best to backfill and, and stretching math teachers across grade levels and subjects to try and do what they could to that. Um, now that we've got math teachers in place, um, we're very hopeful about even in the, over the next couple of months, few months, what they'll be able to do to support scholars. Um, you may recall or, or, um, or perhaps not, our assistant superintendents uh, tier, each of them tiers the schools. They tier the schools within their division, um, depending on need, uh, depending on the, you know, the leadership supports that are necessary or just being really hands-on with the resourcing and ensuring that um, in daily instruction is improving, that teachers are getting the kind of coaching that they need. Um, and so, that is something that I know has been an improvement um, uh, this year uh, with our middle schools. And so appreciative of Dr. Evans' work in that regard. I don't love it, but we've also redirected, and this is throughout the district, but especially, um, not especially, this is throughout the district. Um, I think you probably see more of it in elementary and middle. But we've um, reallocated some of the time and support from our lead partners, from coaching teachers, to working directly with scholars. More of their time, now that's at a premium, obviously, but we're playing catch up from not having the staffing in place. And so in a lot of cases, we've redirected our, um, our lead partners to pull small groups of scholars to work with them, to partner with teachers, to co-teach, that sort of thing. Um, and so we're hopeful that, that that too will hasten the improvement um, and, and achievement 
of our scholars, and then um, and Dr. Evans can certainly speak to this. Finally, we've gotten um, some high to high dosage tutoring um, um, in queue for for our scholars to to also support them, and so these are things that are um, are different different this year and or um, greatly increased or improved uh, practices, and so. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful as a result of those. Let's see what else you've got to well, share, good, Doc. Good evening, good evening. Um, Dr. Green, school board, school board president. Um, you know, this this I think will be my 18th year uh, working with middle schools, and um, what the approach that our team took was really to diagnose why. Um, I, I hear over the years, you know, middle school is the only division where you test 100% of the students, and that's true. But it's been true, and middle schools have not always underperformed or have not always been where we haven't risen uh, to be among the best in, uh, across the board. And so we really sought to understand why. At the beginning of the school year, my, in, um, my most recent work in advanced academics, I understood that our district typically has about 21 math vacancies um, on the first day of school. Middle school division has 16 math vacancies on the first day of school. Many school, every single middle school was missing math teachers. Some schools had no teachers in a grade level. Like there were no eighth grade math teachers, no seventh grade math teachers. We started the year with a plan of, to meet with the coaches. The, 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 every school has a math coach. Well, they pulled those coaches into the classroom, so that means there's not the person to coach the rest of the teachers because we needed every available certified person, assistant principals, whomever, to help be before students so that they can get that instruction um, that, th that they needed. Um, and so we had virtual schools where one teacher at a school would teach, we realigned classes so that a teacher could have sections across the district and teach more than just their school. I mean, we are really trying to think outside of the box about how to address this math shortage. And I thank the high school division for the Jackson Middle College and those excellent uh, future teachers that we have in the pipeline. We just got a few more years to wait on them. So our, our question is, what do we do now? I appreciate this board for allowing us to um, uh, invest in our international teachers. Unfortunately, those teachers with the immigration process, um, they did not all arrive until uh, December. So this is the first semester that we have. We only have one math vacancy um, in our division, and this is the first semester where that has been the case. Um, and so there's a transition period for those. We're working with the Office of um, uh, OTL to be able to provide training and professional development for those new teachers who just come to this country um, and to be trained not only in the JPS way, but just about American education. They know the content. Um, but this is, you know, a cultural um, uh, shift for them that they are making, and they are doing it, and they are doing a, a, a phenomenal job in many, in many places. So we have work to do. What I saw this year was about providing the foundation, really and truly being honest and um, introspectively asking why, and then holding ourselves accountable to achieve at, at higher levels. So that means our principals and um, curriculum leaders in the building must be sharper practitioners. Uh, we need to get the professional development. Um, we have to say, well, if, if even at schools where they have 20% of the students um, achieving proficient and advanced scores, what about the other 80? And that's what I'm always asking. What about the other 80? You know, and if we have 80%, I'm going to say, what about the other 20? And so, I mean, we really have to continuously be solving problems. I believe that the summer bridge programs that we, we kind of moved away from, um, we're getting back to those where sixth graders can be um, transitioned properly into middle school. Um, and we can front load some of those supports, fill some gaps in the summer through the use of federal program dollars and school improvement dollars so that they can have a stronger start to middle school. Um, and so um, we're engaging parents more deeply. Um, we met on last Friday with, the, um, with partners in education to talk about really how can we strengthen our parent core to be able to provide support at home and what, what that could look like. And so there's a, um, um, a layered approach. I, I, I see us getting stronger and stronger every day. It's kind of like when you go to physical therapy. You know, you, you might not be running yet, but you're walking better than you were. And so I appreciate the support that you all have given and, and that uh, my colleagues have given, and definitely the boots on the ground in the classrooms. 
Thank you, Dr. Evans. That's a really helpful update. And any other questions, board members? All right. Thank you, Dr. Thank Evans. You. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for the excellent presentation. Thank you, ladies. All right, board members. Um, next, we'll move on to uh, our discipline data, joyful learning updates. And uh, Ms. Amanda Thomas, our executive director of climate and wellness, will present the information. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Seebeck, Board President, members of the board, Dr. Green, Superintendent, and community members who are still with us this evening. Um, I do have the pleasure of providing discipline updates as well as our updates for commitment for joyful learning environments. Do want to pay or have a focus on our mission statement. Jackson Public Schools develop scholars through world-class learning experiences to attain an exceptional knowledge base, critical and relevant skill sets, and the necessary dispositions for great success. As we go through the discipline data and the updates for joyful learning environments, these will resonate. The objectives for this evening are to analyze and compare the baseline discipline data, which was the school year of 2018-19, to the years of 2019-20 up to this current school year. Also to review the five-year timeline of commitment for key initiatives and to provide those updates. Again, our focus after reviewing the five-year plan for educating Jackson scholars, the targeted outcomes emphasized are suspending 10% or fewer scholars per school year, as well as having our parents and families express overall satisfaction with their scholar school. The next few slides will show the trends in our discipline data from the years of 2019 up to the current year. This first slide shows the yearly number of out of school suspensions for the years of 2018-19 through 23-24. These numbers reflect August through May of each year. So there are no numbers listed for this current year because this is end of the year data. This slide shows the comparison of the number and percentages of students who received out of school suspension for the years of 2018, 22, 23, and the current year, of course, um, no data because it's for August through May. There was a slight increase in the percentage of students receiving out of school suspension as a discipline consequence from 22, 23 to 23, 24 school year. I do want to note that the cumulative enrollment may increase as um, Dr. Strong so eloquently um, explained on the last evening board meeting. They may increase from January to May, so during that particular year for 22-23, the cumulative enrollment for all year was roughly 20,536, and then in 21-22, the enrollment was 21,484, so therefore you see a slight increase in the percentage of scholars at the end of the year. Overall district comparison of the number of out of school suspension for the years of 2018 up through the current year, 2023, for the first semester combined. Again, these are for the months of August through December. So you do see data for this current school year. The number of out of school suspension had steadily declined from the baseline year of 1819. However, there is an increase with the total for August through December for this year being 2,701. Again, five-year comparison with the number and percentage of students receiving out-of-school suspension for August through December. The number of students receiving out-of-school suspension as a discipline consequence has increased this year, again, in comparison to last year. In keeping in line with our academic presentations, we also wanted to share the breakdown of out of school suspensions for students enrolled in APAC, IB, um, our English learners, as well as our um, SPED programs. This graph shows percentage of students within the subgroups 
as it relates to the number of out-of-school suspensions issued for the months of August through December. For example, the 76.9% of the 1,794 scholars receiving out-of-school suspension were enrolled in non-special programs. As an academic team, we look at the trends as it relates to the subgroups of students and staff members from various departments, and we identify those staff members to provide additional support to the schools. Plans are developed, IEP and 504 plans are reviewed and revised, and additional referrals are made if further evaluation is needed. This slide provides information about the top reasons district-wide that our scholars have been suspended. You will note that the top consequences are similar each year. The Code of Conduct was revised prior to the beginning of the 1920 school year, so the language differs um, slightly. The next set of slides will provide a deeper look at the data for this current school year. This slide depicts data for the elementary division. Um, data is provided for schools that have a percentage of 2% or higher, so all elementary schools are not listed. The number of out-of-school suspensions for each school is the combined total for the semester. If you look at Raines Elementary, they have the, an equal number of out-of-school suspension issued, as well as the students receiving this consequence. This suggests that students' behavior improves when they return to school after receiving an out-of-school suspension consequence. For these students, the negative behavior decreased. For schools that have more OSS issues than the number of scholars with out-of-school suspension, there are scholars receiving this consequence multiple times. This slide displays the discipline data for the middle school division. You will note that Bailey APAC has the same number of out-of-school suspensions and students receiving the consequence. This again suggests that the student's behavior was redirected. The other schools have higher numbers for out-of-school suspension than students, and that data confirms that some of the students are receiving, again, multiple out-of-school suspensions. This slide displays the discipline data for the high school division. Again, for the schools that have higher numbers of out-of-school suspension than students, the data confirms that some scholars have received out-of-school suspension more than one time during this time period. Do want to note that, each, that at each division level, um, some schools have limited number of out-of-school suspensions, and many of the students receiving out-of-school suspensions as a consequence correct their behavior after being issued the consequence. And principals attribute this to having a focus on positive behavior interventions and supports, where they emphasize rules and expectations at the beginning of the school year and consistently after breaks. Leaders also attribute the low suspension numbers to supporting teachers with classroom management strategies, also utilizing alternatives to out-of-school suspensions, such as before and after school detention, in-school detention, and in school suspension. The dean of students who are in the high schools and middle schools analyze data as well and meet with the students who are receiving this consequence. Conferences are held with the scholars and their parents upon their return to discuss plans and expectations to decrease the number of scholars receiving this consequence. As we conclude this portion of the presentation, as a reminder, our goal is to have 10% or fewer of our scholars suspended by the end of school year 2024. You will note that in spring um, 18, 19, 15% of our scholars were, to, were suspended. In the spring of 2022, 23, we had 12.8% of JPS scholars suspended. And at the end of the semester, December 2023, we had 9.5% of our scholars suspended, which means 90.5% of our scholars have received, have not received an out-of-school suspension as a consequence. Again, our goal for the end of the year, which will be the end of our five-year plan, is to have 10% or fewer of our scholars suspended.
The next slides will provide you with visual graphics and snippets of the work that we have done district-wide as it relates to Jackson Public Schools key initiatives for commitment for joyful learning environment. This work further promotes positive discipline and the implementation of joyful learning environment. You will note that the slides are for um, the five year span, so we just see some of the visuals. This was Vision to Learn that provided free screening to the JPS students at various locations. We utilized the Safer app to track COVID numbers and to keep students safe during the pandemic. And um, healthy meals were provided to our scholars at school sites as well as through the use of transportation services during this time. Also, several vaccination clinics were held. External partners and various organizations assisted in the organization and administering of these vaccines. To further um, our scholars' well-being, Marion Counseling Services conducted workshops for our parents and scholars. And also this year, we revived the um, wellness walk in October. Staff and community members engaged in the physical activity as well as breast cancer survivors were recognized. Also, Jackson Heights Comprehensive Center added two school-based health clinics and 21 additional schools to their agreement. We also added Mississippi Smiles as a new partner. Just to recap, engaging families to support scholars' well-being and development being our first initiative. We continue to partner with agencies. We continue to encourage families and scholars, as well as students, to engage in physical activities and our child nutrition department continues to prepare healthy lunches and snacks for our scholars doing in-person and virtual learning. Our second key initiative is district accountability model for climate and wellness. As stated in the plan, we want our parents and families to express overall satisfaction with their child's school. The baseline data was gathered from the um, comprehensive assessment administered in the 1920 school year, where the academic team reviewed these questions and selected 10 questions, which in turn gave us Thrive, our school climate report card. Again, we continue to administer the comprehensive needs assessment to stakeholders. The Thrive school report card has been developed, and we now have two years of data from the Thrive Report Card. Um, just for one example, for question nine, I am satisfied with the way school staff members, administrators, teachers, counselors, and school staff treat students and the level of concern that is shown for the students at the school. During the 21-22 school year, parents were 74.8% satisfied, and last school year, 22-23, we had increased with 80.9% being satisfied. The third initiative, fostering relationships between scholars and adults. Again, we have talked um, about the problems, which is TAP, and this was an induction at Blackburn Middle School. We still have the mental health warm line. It was launched in 2021, and now it's, it's still operable, and it actually is um, on call 24-7. Also, 21-22, this was members of the Lit and Lifted Truck Club who donated bikes and teacher care packages to several schools. And also, we held a dad summit in February of 2022 titled A Dad's Health is a School's Wealth, and it was attended with over 300 fathers and sons. 22-23, we still host um, technology and literacy workshops for our parents and scholars. Also, looking at 23-24, we've had several of our staff members to be recognized and to receive the Alice Clark Excellence in Education Award, which recognizes exemplary K-12 educators in their viewing region who reflect exceptional teaching methodologies, positively impact school culture, and actively engages with their community. So we see those teachers there, as well as the JPS school social workers hired under the school-based mental health grant provide small group and individual counseling sessions to scholars. In addition to these sessions, they do um, distribute food boxes to families. They respond to referrals, and they collaborate with MAP, which is making a plan 
team members to provide services and supports to our families. And these services do include um, utility payments. This initiative, fostering relationships between um, scholars and caring adults, again, we just continue to host events. We continue to utilize talk about the problem, which is tapped to mediate conflicts with peers, our positive behavior interventions and supports, and we continue to encourage our staff to be success mentors for our scholars. Our next initiative, researching and implementing a district-wide framework to address social emotional learning. Um, the district's initial implementation of social emotional learning began in the school year of 1920, and it consists of JPS adopting the um, CASTLE Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning Framework. We continue to utilize this framework and during the 21-22 school year, the implementation of the Rethink SEL curriculum began and the superintendent introduced student board representatives and these student voices have continued to be lifted at the local and state levels. Again, just to summarize, staff members continue to use the three SEL signature practices throughout their lessons. We're in year two of the implementation of the Rethink SEL curriculum, and we continue to analyze and monitor the uses of this platform. Young people continue to contribute and lead discussions as we saw this evening. The Board of Trustees, as well as schools, provide opportunities for scholars to share their opinions and plans for improving policies, as well as the overall organization. This initiative fostering learning experiences that are fun and deeply engaging. Again, you'll review the visuals of some of the scholars' fun learning experiences, starting with JROTC, the Global Citizen Project, which began in 2021, and also Jim Hill cheerleaders continuing to um, be competitive with their skills. We have the Learning Garden that opened at Galloway Elementary, the United States Secretary of Education, visited Casey Elementary and the Arts Initiative as well as the after school programs. The summer reading parade and block party was a success at Forest Hill High School. And during this school year, we've had our JPS scholars to compete in swim meets and receive awards. JPS ROTC scholar receives scholarships and the CDC continues to receive recognition and accolades for the apps that they develop. Again, this was our final initiative, Fostering Learning Experiences. The Global Citizen Project, sponsored by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, allows JPS to live into its core value of relevance. Scholars can view education within different cultures around the world, and we're in the third year of this project. Our key takeaways. Over the last five years, the number of disciplinary infractions resulting from out-of-school suspension has declined. The district commitment to engaging families in the social development and well-being of their scholars, implementing social-emotional learning, promoting positive relationships with scholars and adults while engaging in fun and meaningful activities, and providing joyful learning environments continues to produce positive results. We and JPS will continue to utilize resources and alternatives to reduce the percentage of scholars receiving out of school suspension. The work that has been done around the key initiatives has proven effective as evidenced by the discipline data and the parent survey results. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Board members, questions, comments? It's a great report. <laughs> It was an excellent report, I agree. I do have a few questions. It, <laughs> you knew I, was, I wasn't going to let you get away without some. It's your love language. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and there were some of these things, Ms. Thomas, I apologize. I, they were the things I saw that I just didn't see when I reviewed it initially, so I didn't get you advanced questions. So okay. um, the first one was is, is just a clarification question. Um, and the slides aren't numbered, uh, but it's out of school suspension, five year comparisons, August through December. There's two of them. Yeah. Yes. One is the student, one is all 
suspensions and, and one is, is students. And the difference yeah. is a student may have been suspended more than once. Oh, I understand. Okay, yeah. so, so, so the lower number, if you go to the one with the 1794. Exactly, and the, that's the number of students. That's like a unique, mm -hmm. okay. That's, and I tried that. to emphasize that when I stated of the 1,794 students suspended when we looked at the subgroups, that yeah, those okay. are the number of, of scholars. And then that 9.5% is the percentage. Okay, that, that's really helpful. Um, and then the, ne the next question is, this is just a, is, is actually related uh, to the previous um, presentation as well. So the, if you look, you know, Blackburn, Cardozo, Powell, Witt, and Wingfield all have um, um, out of school suspensions of over 20% and they're all school improvement. Um, Kirksey is, is uh, it doesn't is the numbers are lower, but so I just wanted to ask a question: Are we looking at that? Is there a correlation? Should we be making investments around climate? And, may, and maybe some of that was because I know that a lot of the interventions were schools that moved out. It, we had hired people, and so maybe they're related. Well, I'm going to start by just saying there's definitely we're definitely looking at it, and there's definitely a correlation. But I'm going to let Dr. Evans expound. <laughs> we. Yes, sir. In 60 seconds. We do know where there is no teacher, the discipline is a little different. And so one of those solutions was to get um, certified teachers in the classroom. And then this year with the um, implementation of the deans of students, they are being trained to be proactive and develop those relationships so that the discipline won't occur. And the, and the deans aren't, um, <laughs> the deans aren't, um, they're, they're supportive, and so they're not administrative, per se. Well, not officially administ administrative. And so they, while they don't um, give suspensions, out-of-school suspensions, they do make recommendations. Mm -hmm. And they are working with principals and schools around that. And so, um, you know, that's certainly something we flag. We, we have this additional resource in all of our um, uh, secondary schools, middle and high school, but we've also seen some uptick in, in suspensions. But also some of this is a number of our principals um, are seeking to set a tone and address some behaviors that just need to be addressed. Yeah. Great. Uh, one more question, um, Ms. Thomas, and it's, this is in reference to the on-track slide, which I believe is forward right there um, and it's just a question are we on track to hit it this year if we're at nine and a half percent by the end of the first term we gotta have some really strong <laughs> performance the second semester so I just wanted to, uh, if, if you could share some more on that uh, projection and actually I changed one part of it but did not change Just no we are when you look at the, I'm going to say the baseline year, and you look at this particular year, um, not to 10 percent, um, but definitely, and I'm going to hold to this and, and be very hopeful that much um, fewer than the 15 percent during our baseline year of 2018-19. Okay, so fewer <laughs> than our baseline year. Oh, yes. But if, if we end it. 13%, that'll be a trend of increasing three years in a row. And I know we often look at trends as a signal of whether or not interventions are working. Um, do you think we'll end below the 12? Are we going to increase this year, or do you think we're, that's, that's just a, 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 that's not indicative of a trend? Your question, do I think that we will increase this year? I think that we will land around the 12.6, 12.8. Okay, so, so hold and serve mm -hmm. roughly. Okay. And I hope to report that at the end of this school year. This question made me have a follow up. This may be quick. I'm, I'm not sure that there's going to be a, a way to answer this. Would have been nice to ask ahead of time. Um, two of the middle schools that are on this list for having a high percentage of students, um, and I, I take it this is a first semester out of school suspension. 
our peoples in Witten. Um, and that just sort of catches my eye based off combining those two schools, the, the consolidation occurred first semester. Do we, are those linked? Do we think that there's uh, any spillover as between the two? I don't know what their numbers were the year before. Have we seen an uptick with them being together? I mean, that's just one of the things I'm, I kind of want to keep an eye on. Okay. So peoples in Witten, I, I can state that these are, and these suspensions are just for those particular sides of the school. So this is, the, mm -hmm. they're separate, they're not consolidated. Um, and I will look at the previous school years, but I did look at these particularly because I know this is something that Ms. Thompson had asked about as well. Um, they're pretty similar to the previous school year, so there's not been an uptick. Also, as relates to the two of them being consolidated, there's only been roughly one incident where um, those particular scholars have been involved in an incident together. And I know that from the um, alternative placement side. Do you want to? I think, I think she said it. The, yep. the, these incidents are separate. They just yep. happen to be housed in the same building. So we see that as a win that is not um, because of the merger, but we have work to do individually. I'll ask um, uh, Ms. Williams if you'll take a note. Let's get the data from last year from those two schools and share it out. And we can share it out between now and the next meeting. Great. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Again, one, one, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Evans and Ms. Thomas. Um, thank you. Uh, I do want to also lift up again, um, it's very clear a lot of work went into this presentation. So thank you for all the effort that goes behind generating the numbers that look really pretty on the slide. So thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, um, we will move on to our information action items. I will invite Mr. Burke up. We have two items. First, we have the request to approve a consulting service agreement with results biz for project management services. And then we have the approval of the monthly financial report for month ended January 31st, 2024. Mr. Burke, if you could run through both, we'll vote on them together. Yes, sir. Uh, the administration, uh, good evening, board, Superintendent Green, Board President Seaback. Those remaining in the audience, all these lovely presentations that I have to follow. The administration recommends approval of a consulting services agreement with Riz, uh, Results B is to facilitate project management for the implementation of the Tyler Muniz Enterprise Resource Planning System. This consulting service agreement grants Results B is authorization to provide project management support services for the implementation of the, the ERP. The agreement is pivotal to the assisting JPS staff to ensure the successful and timely implementation of the, the ERP system. Results Biz will spearhead the project, coordinating closely with Tyler Technologies. Their scope of services encompasses a successful implementation and a seamless go live experience across all modules, including financial management, human resource management, payroll, revenue management, enterprise assets management, content management, data services, and recurring services. There were some questions around did we speak to ref, uh, references, did we check references to gauge past performance on projects of similar size and scope? Uh, simply yes, uh, we um, prepared a list of about 11 questions that encompassed uh, and tried to delve into their capacity, their ability to stay on budget, their um, ability to meet the objectives of an implementation um, and the overall sense of success from other customers. And we did receive some uh, in those um, interactions. They were very favorable uh, results. Uh, one said, uh, despite the, the challenges, the challenging circumstances, they uh, ResBid quickly in, uh, integrated into the project and took the lead on many implemented uh, tasks. Uh, that same response they picked up uh, from an internal staff member that had passed away and they took on the complete implementation. Um, another respondent, uh, and this was from the city of Jackson as a matter of fact, uh, the first one was from Alexandria, Louisiana, it was a, this uh, chief financial officer of their sheriff's department. They implemented it for the city, uh, for their sh the law enforcement office. Uh, this was the city of Jackson. Um, they were crucial. Uh, they played a crucial role in the full implementation of the Tyler Muniz system, acting as project manager for finance and payroll. Their responsibilities extended 
to ongoing training and troubleshooting of various departments. Their they met the initial obje objectives and goals of the implementation that were clear and helped them clearly define those objectives and goals. And ultimately, their satisfaction, the satisfaction of key, hold key stakeholders, particularly the City of Jackson employees, is generally, uh, was generally positive. And any instances of dissatisfaction were quickly addressed and remedied uh, by uh, res B uh, results bids. I will say that there was um, a, a comment not included in your notes from Tyler Technologies. They were recommended by them. They, uh, as a local player, uh, there are many Tyler Technology users in Mississippi, not necessarily school districts, municipalities, and they implemented several of the um, systems in our surrounding us. Great. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Any questions, board members? Thank you. Okay, next um, we'll move on to the request to approve the monthly financial report for month ending January 31st. Yes, sir. The administration recommends that the board approve the monthly financial report for month ending January 31st, 2024. Again, you have a copy of uh, the monthly financial report, which includes statement of fund balance, budget status report, bank reconciliation report, and the district maintenance cash flow. Uh, th some highlights of that report from the statement of fund balance uh, referencing page four, our funding balance. Fund I will remind you our fund balance for the beginning of the year was $22.7 million at July 1. Uh, as of January 31st, it has dipped to 5.7. This is $7 million lower than our January 23rd Janu uh, fund balance position. Uh, this is attributed to, uh, again, continuing um, to carry uh, some very heavy um, expenditures for other funds. Uh, right now, that is up to the tune of $17 million, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, page 7, the 16 section revenues, uh, fund 1840, we have collected almost 75% of what we budgeted at somewhere a little under $700,000, uh, which is a positive trend. Uh, referencing page uh, 8, child, uh, child nutrition funds, again, continuing to carry <coughs> a significant cash balance there, but continuing to spend that those funds on improving our cafeteria uh, experience for our scholars. Our title funds, which are our 2211 um, special revenue funds, also the coronavirus funds, IDEA funds, and other special revenues, these are referenced on page eight through nine. We have um, our carrying expenses of, across those funds and their fund balances are currently negative uh, 12.6 million. We have recently completed drawdowns of about 7.8 um, so we are con constantly monitoring and trying to get those uh, expenditures submitted and getting those funds uh, back in. Um, but the status report section, as of July 31st, in Fund 1120, which is our main operating fund, we had anticipated revenues for the year budgeted of $200.7 million. We have cl collected year-to-date $76.6 million, which is roughly 38.2% of what we budgeted. We anticipated uh, expenditures equaling that $200.7 million and we have expended 93.6 million which is roughly 46.7 percent of what we uh, plan to expand in all of our other funds we budgeted uh, anticipated revenues of 284.3 million we have year-to-date collected 118.9 million across all other funds we uh, anticipated revenues of uh, expenditures of 269.9 million we have only expended 92.8 million which is about 34.3 so all in all, we have a total budget for the entire district of 485, point, uh, 485 million. We have um, collected about 195.5 million, which is 40.3%, and we have expended uh, 186.4 million, which is 39.6%. Bank reconciliations are complete through December 31st. They are uh, being held with approved board depositories and bank statements have been reconciled appropriately. You will see that on page 26 through 28. The, class, the cash flow uh, report as of January 31st, our ending cash balance was $2.8 million in our district maintenance fund uh, compared to January of 2023, which was 7.4. This is roughly a 61% decrease uh, in our cash position. And then some other key indicators, um, headlines from, for January 31st. Total revenues collected um, is about $3.6 million less than last year. This reflects a $10.3 million charter school payment that we made in January. That payment was made on January 16th. 
uh, to our charter school, um, charter schools located in, in Jackson. Overall expenditures year to date, 3.7 million greater than last year. Um, this is made up of primarily property liability insurance increases that we talked about during the budgetary process. We did anticipate these. And then contracted services have been a little bit higher. Uh, our inability to hire internally uh, plumbing services are causing us to have to go outside and get those and, and procure those services, which is making contracted services a little higher than normal. Uh, Avalon uh, collections year to date, 2.4% uh, less than last year. Uh, this collections are still lagging by 9%. There was some continual uh, drag from um, their software attack. Did have some good news. We did um, get our check today from Avalon. It is actually 41 million or so, which is uh, higher than it was last year by about $500,000. So we're pretty encouraged that they're catching up and that will show in, in next month's uh, financial report. And then total personnel uh, benefits costs year to date compared to prior years <coughs> are only $879,000 greater, which is about 1.18%, um, which is really good considering, um, but we attribute this to the fact that we still carry um, in the budget about 500 positions that have gone unfilled. Uh, 206 of those are certified staff and about 294 have been classified staff. That is your financial report for the month of uh, ending January 31st. I'll take any questions, comments, criticisms, and or wonderings. Thank you, Mr. Berg. You're welcome. Board members, questions? Is the, uh, Mr. Berg, is the um, Four, uh, yeah, four, four and a half million dollar decrease from last year's cash, cash position. Is that also related to, is it, is it a timing with the heavier projects that you mentioned earlier with the fund balance? Yes, sir. Cash flow is, is, is just a function of when expenditures show yeah. up. Um, it's, it's, we're trying to pay timely. A lot of our, our vendors are small businesses that rely on us to make sure we get these things paid. And then, there, then there's the requirement that we pay within 45 days to be good, um, good partners so it just it just depends on the frequency at which those invoices come in and we're really pumping hard to get these uh, ESSER uh, projects done and get those pay apps in so we can get those drawdowns uh, submitted because we are getting uh, getting close to that um, September 30th date great thank you board members are there if there's no other questions is there a motion to approve items a and b information action. I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Uh, next we have consent agenda items finance. Mr. Burke, uh, quick question. Uh, I do have a question on that. Yes, that sir. This is the question that I raised earlier about the $2.5 million ESSER bid for Jim Hill that we're rejecting. Yes, sir. And um, so, um, I don't need to know why. I mean, I understand why that the materials. But the, my question is, are we going to be able to spend the two and a half million dollars elsewhere? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're at that point now where we are uh, <coughs> making decisions about those projects. We know we're not going to be able to get um, encumbered and, and, and complete by the deadline. So those dollars will be moved to other expenditures. Okay. Yeah, the goal is still not to leave any money on the table. No, that, that's, you read my mind. That, yes, that, 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 that was that what was behind the question. The and Dr. Burgett, isn't it soon? Soon. Soon, soon and very um, soon. Isn't it uh, true that we have a, a not so short list, but a, a list of projects that um, we can, if we find ourselves in a similar situation, that we can divert those dollars to fund? Yes. Okay. Yes, we're, we're looking for those opportunities uh, as well. We want to do those things that we know we can get done. Mm -hmm. uh, they may, you may see, I think you saw in the presentation, some conversation about change orders. Mm -hmm. That'll be how we, how we do that. So we don't have to go back through the, there'll be smaller projects that we can get in that window. That makes sense to the projects that we're already doing. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, board members. Um, so uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items finance? Motion. Second. Mr. McGuffey has moved. Mr. Figger seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda items general. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously. We've had the opportunity to ask the administration questions. 
Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Sorry. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hilliard is seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have consent agenda items personnel. Uh, all the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask the administration questions. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda personnel? So moved. Second. Mr. Figures has moved. Dr. Harrison has seconded. All in favor? Aye. The motion carries. Um, I believe we do have an executive session. And so, um, is there a motion to close the board meeting to consider executive session? So moved. Second. Dr. Hairston has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Go to the office. JPS counselors were recognized for their invaluable contributions. I can truly say that I am proud of the work that professional school counselors do. I've learned that we can emphasize that we can accomplish difficult tasks with support. And the highlight of the event, the announcement of the JPS Counselor of the Year. From Jim Hill, Dr. Edney Edna Stacks from Washington. This is a team award because we're family over at Jim Hill. All JPS counselors are appreciated for their dedication, their passion, and their unwavering commitment to the success of our scholars. I would like for you to please stand for the presentation of the colors from Lanier High School JRTC Bulldogs. Carrie, colors. 